Hello and welcome to the 40 Summit 2020 Digital Experience. Uh, today I will be speaking about the new, a new era of debugging. But first, let me introduce myself. My name is Tim Penner and I am a Senior Technical Services Engineer at 40 Incorporated in San Jose, California. So, let's jump right in. Debugging can be difficult. 4D knows this and has been working hard to try to make your debugging experience better. As such, 4D has recently been updated to include some new features that uh, are very helpful for debugging. These new features such as uh, the new call chain command and the ability to debug calls to process 4D tags, even in compiled mode, and the ability to enable debug logs for a single specific process. All of these open up new possibilities for debugging. This session talks about these new features along with some existing um, techniques that help round out the debugging toolkit. So first, let's, let's look at a session overview here. Today we will be talking about some new features in B18, such as uh, we will be talking about the debugging process 40 tags, which was introduced in V18 specifically. We will also be talking about the call chain command. This is a version 18 command that was first introduced in V17 R6. So although it is an R6, V17 R6 command, it's, it's technically V18. Um, we will also be talking about the debug log for a single process. This was first introduced in 17 R5, but again, that is a V18 feature. All of the R releases are an accumulation leading up to the uh, V18, uh, or I should say to the next release. I'm sure you guys are already aware of that. Uh, we will also be talking about some existing techniques. We'll re recap some existing techniques, such as we will talk about the 40 information component, the 40 info report, also known as. We'll be talking about crash reports on Mac OS, and we will also be talking about dump files on Windows. And just to round everything out, we'll also be talking about the event viewer on Windows. So, let's jump right in. New in V18. What is new? Well, process 40 tags. This command has been around for a while, but the command has been updated, or I should say enhanced, with each new version of 4D. And the last edition, such as 40 code, has drastically increased the use cases. What was previously a single line of code is now often many lines or even pages of 40 code. This being used to deliver dynamic code in compiled applications. But sometimes an issue arises that can only be observed at the customer site. In those situations, debugging can be uh, difficult. So what next? Well, quite simply, in V18, you can now use the debugger in compiled mode. Let that sink in for a moment before I clarify. You cannot use the debugger with your compiled code, but you can invoke the debugger and use it from within the code that is being processed by process 40 tags. Simply insert the trace command in your code and away you go. So let's recap. Simply use the trace command in the code that's being fed into process 40 tags. This works in both compiled and interpreted mode, and it even works in built merged applications. Um, this does not allow you to debug your own compiled code. Uh, it only allows the debugging of the dynamic code that is processed by 40, uh, by, by, the, by the process 40 tags command. Essentially, that dynamic code is being executed in an interpreted um, context, which is why that dynamic code is able to be debugged. So let's look at a demonstration. So let's see if I can get out of Keynote real quick and over to my demonstration here. Here we go. So here is the um, sample application that came with the um, session material. So here for debugging process 40 tags, we're going to look at demo one. Uh, demo one. Oh, there it is, open on my other screen. So here we go. Uh, first, let's just look at some dynamic code that you can execute. So first, I'm just going to preview this, which just kind of tokenizes it, and then we're gonna execute it. So what this did was it executed a very simple um, line of code, which just simply says, hello, 40 Summit 2020. 
Um, as you can see here, we could change this to be whatever we want to be, just to show that this is a dynamic execution. Um, so now it says what I had just typed in. There we go. So let's look at example two, which is, uh, again, another, this is really just to demonstrate some of what you can do with process 40 tags, just to kind of remind you guys here. So here, well, this is a simple for loop, which is just going to loop over and give us a result. So here we can see that the result is uh, 5,050. And if I was to come in here and change the uh, parameters for the for loop and rerun it, we'll see that, well, it, it does rerun with those new parameters. So let's look again at something that's just a little bit more um, advanced. Uh, I'm sure that you guys have stuff that's a lot more advanced than this. But so here we're just going to truncate a table and then we're gonna loop over um, for about 100 times and create a record within that table. So here we can run that and it now tells us how many, um, how many records exist. So this, this may be a better example, this last one right here, that you may run into an issue and you may need to uh, then trace on. So let's, let's quickly just add something here and let's just go down to the bottom right for the, um, the alert and let's just add the trace. We can see that we now have the trace command there and if we execute this, well, sure enough, it's opened on the other screen here. Let me just move it up here. We can see that the trace command has run. So this is a fully um, functional debug window, the same debug window that you are probably already used to using. You can take the, um, the execution point and move it around if you need to. And um, yeah, I mean, this is a fully functional debugger right here. So if we just run this and then run it again, uh, we can see that now it has 200 records. So um, let me just quickly come in here and show you another thing here. If we were to comment out that first line and rerun this, well now we're not truncating the table. So we again got our trace. So if there was an error, we would be able to dig further down from here, drill further down from here, uh, but running it, we now see that we've got 300 records. So as you can see, this dynamic code that, that is written in here is executing and we have a debugger available. Again, this works in compiled mode. It also works in a merged application. Quite useful. Very, very useful if I do say so myself. So with that, let's go back to our, our presentation. Next, let's talk about the call chain command. This, this is a biggie. This is a real biggie, the call chain command, guys. So this is probably the most voted upon feature request um, that I'm aware of. Uh, the call chain command provides an in-depth view of the call stack leading up to the current point of code execution. You may be familiar with the call chain. Um, it's visible at the top of the debug window. It kind of shows, you know, the chain of methods that have been executed leading up to the point that you're currently at. So let's look at what this call chain command does. Well, um, it provides a, it returns a collection of objects that describe each step along the current call chain. Uh, each object within the collection contains the following data points. Uh, there's the database name, uh, which is the name of, of the database or component, because when you have a call chain, some of the items within the call chain may not be within the main database. It may be a component method that's being called. So this, that first item helps you identify where it is being executed. Uh, the next one is the line, which is, well, pretty obvious. It's the line number of the command to the call. Uh, the line number of the call to the method, I should say. Uh, the next item is the name. Uh, the name of the method is being called. Uh, and then the last one is the type. This is, um, you know, a bit more interesting. It's the type of the method that's being called, which could be a project method. It could be a form object method. It could be a database method, um, a trigger method, execute on server, which is seen with uh, the execute on server method attribute. And it could also be execute formula, which is typically seen with the process 40 tags command, or even the evaluation of a formula in a 40 write pro document. So let's look at what the actual output looks like. So essentially, well, it, it's JSON. It's, uh, it's an object um, like this. So this is a single item here. This is just a single um, 
one single method that's being executed. Um, now let's look at something that's a bit more in depth. Uh, if the form object method is executed, the call chain could contain, for example, this. Um, this is read from the bottom up. So we can see that the first that we first ran a project method name show detail form uh, from the database name my database, which on line two calls form. That's the bottom most object, the first item in the call stack. The next object tells us that the form method uh, for detail form was executed from my database, which on line two calls the next item in this call stack. That's the middle object within this collection. The final object within this collection tells us that a form object method for the detail form dot button was executing from my database on line one. That is where we called the call chain command. So, um, you know, let, 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 let's recap here. Um, the command returns a collection of objects that describe each step along the current call chain. This information uh, provided by the git call chain command is the uh, same information as obtained from the call chain area of the debugger. The git call chain command can be called from any 4D environment, including compiled applications, merged applications, interpreted applications. So it's it's very useful, very versatile. Um, that's supposed to be going through those. So let's look at a quick demonstration here. Here we have our sample database that is included with the um, with the session material. So here in this section right here, we have the call chain information. So if we click on this button right here, we will create an error. Essentially, this um, is an error message uh, that is using a specific error handler that utilizes the call chain command. Um, the the method is included in the um, in the session material, and essentially, I feel that um, you know air handlers are probably the most useful use of this command. I mean, there may be other uses for this command. I'm sure that uh, you know, as you guys are all developers, you will most likely find other uses for this command. But again, I just feel that um, you know an air handler is the most natural location for this. Uh, so that's where we're where I've set this up this sample, this example for. So if we select the folder here, um, and then we'll just select the air folder which is included in the um, database here. So here we could see that we've got all these different um, JSON files. Essentially what happens with this um, with, with this specific example here is that it, the air handler, it's designed to be ran in place of well, the, the air handler. So anytime you have an air, the air handler is going to run. What the air handler does is it collects the um, the call chain along with the other information that's uh, available for the air, and it stores it all within a JSON file within the airs folder of the database. Um, the airs folder inside of the logs folder of the database. So at any point in time, you could then collect that logs folder, or you could uh, collect the individual JSON files, perhaps send them to you. There's various things that you could do with this. Uh, but essentially, this is a parser for those files. So as you can see here, um, we have the call chain down here at the bottom, and we have the air stack here in the middle. And we also have additional air details right here. Um, so up here at the very top, we have the different JSON files that have been created and that do exist within the logs folder. Uh, so as we click around, it will load the different log files. Uh, so essentially, it's it's a it's a air browser, an air log parser browser. That again, down here at the bottom, this is the call chain. Uh, it's read from the bottom up. So in this situation right here for this file. We could see that there was a no such file or directory that was that was found. That was the error, which is error negative 43. This was found on line number six of the test error method. So um, essentially, here is the error stack right here in the middle. 
down here at the bottom we can see that it started off by calling the show demo form first and then we click the button from that form uh, which is just named button and uh, which then called a method named test error test error produces this error itself which then invokes the error handler uh, the error handler it does show up in the call chain because essentially the get call chain command is executed inside of the error handler. So um, that command, the get call chain command, will produce the full call chain leading up to the point where it's called. So since we called it from the error handler, well, that's why the error handler is there. But we can see the previous line beneath the error handler line here uh, which shows that test error was called on line 6. Um, this is the actual line where um, the, the issue occurred. So this um, there, there could be a little bit of additional um, improvement with this. Um, this is a good base starting point for you I think but perhaps you know you may want to uh, improve the level of um, the, the mechanism that's used for collecting the logs. Um, I didn't really touch on that at all in the notes at all because I felt like you know sending it via email could be problematic because if you're having a problem that's that you're logging it's very possible that you also are having internet issues so like sending the log file via email may not be the best choice you know it may not always work so there may be some other uh, nuances that you may need to go through but in either case if you're just creating the log file and saving it locally um, that can be done different and separately then the collection of those logs. Those collection of logs can be done either in real time via, like I said, email, FTP, or it could just be done after the fact when an actual issue occurs. So let's get back over to the demo presentation. So next feature more precise debug logs. As a 40 developer, you may have already activated the debug log to troubleshoot problems. One thing you may have noticed, depending on how busy your application is, is that the debug logs can contain a lot of information. This is in part because the logs will contain every line of code that is executed for every single process within the application. So um, there are some ways to mitigate that size. Uh, some existing ways to mitigate the large logs include circular logging. Um, in this example up here, uh, we limit the logs to 50. So essentially, uh, after you've created 50 debug logs, for example, the 51st log will then delete the oldest log. So you should never have more than 50 logs that exist. So that's one way to mitigate a large um, collection of debug logs, like if you need to enable the debug log. So another way to mitigate the size is with the log command list. Uh, essentially the log command list, it's available through the set database parameter, just like the circular log limitation is. But the, the log command list, what it does is it, uh, it, it's a list of command numbers uh, that you want to log. So essentially we're only going to add an entry into the debug log for these commands. So in this specific example that's here on the, on the slide, we're only logging query and query selection. So uh, perhaps you might want to also include all records or maybe some other things, query, um, query formula, query by formula, um, something else. So you would need to get those command numbers and add them to this list in order to mitigate having a large log. But you know, that's not always very useful. I mean, you don't always know which um, commands you need to log and more precisely even if you were to use these it's still going to be logging everything in every single process all of the queries that are done in every single process so what we've done here in v18 that's new is we've now added the ability for you to invoke the debug log for a single process just one single process not the whole application but just one so how is this done well uh, the set database parameter command now accepts a new selector the current process debug log recording, that's the name of the selector, that corresponds to long int value 111. 
Uh, this can be called from any part of a process and it will start logging just for the current process and it'll create a 40 debug log underscore p number underscore y value dot text file um, in, the, in the 40 logs folder where essentially um, the, the there's two parts to that where the, there will be a p number that includes the process number and then the last number is just the sequence number of the log like I said it maybe you limit it to 50, so then you would get a sequence number up to 50, um, then 51, anyways, the sequence number. It's just the sequence of the logs. Of course, you can also get the process debug log state using the new selector with the get database parameter command to figure out whether or not it is currently enabled. So, let's recap. There is a new selector for set database parameter. Uh, the current process law current process debug log recording this equates to uh, val long int value 111 and this works in compiled interpreted and built applications um, you get much more precise debug logs and the logs on disk um, will include the process number in the name so let's look at a quick demonstration here So down here at the bottom, we have the uh, single process debug log section right here. Now in here, if you were to click that button, you'll get this nice little window that essentially just opens up uh, this. It just shows you the, the syntax that you would use. Now you can just copy this code and for us what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to include this in one of our previous examples. This kind of allows us to highlight that um, these area that this area right here is fully um, editable so I'm just going to do that and then execute it and there we go so you can see here now that the, the first line that was run was the set database parameter command to enable the debug log for this process so if we were to go and look into the um, into the I'm, I'm trying to pull it up right now but if we were to go and look into the uh, logs folder for this database we should see that we now have this let me just pull this up right now so here is the uh, database um, folder and let's go here to the logs folder now here we are this is the uh, log that was just created we can see that it was process number nine now if we run this again let's just do that real quick we're gonna go to a different one here let's go to this example paste that in execute there we go now if we close this and come back over here we should see is that also I think that was also process number nine because it's actually running in the same process as this that's that's what I think is going on here yeah let me just do this number one bring it back up here execute there we go now we can see that we have a new process number down there uh, essentially I had forgotten that when I'm clicking this button I'm running this in the same process uh, I'm not executing these in, in additional processes so in either case there we go uh, so as you can see there's a different log for, for each time we ran that unique to the process that was running so you could then use any debug log analyzer that you already have that already exists to analyze that file uh, there's multiple that exist there that, that there's multiple on kb.40.com as well as some that exist on blog.40.com well, let's see here let's go right back over to our presentation and let's talk let's recap some existing techniques so these are not particularly new in B18 but they are important especially if you're unaware of them so first I'd like to discuss the 40 information component also referred to as 40 info reports 
The 4D information component is used to gather information, and this can be very useful for gathering information before an issue arises. Gathering information before an issue arises allows you to go back and look at historical data to see what may have changed around the time that the problem started. So the 4D information component tracks statistics over time. By default, it's a five minute interval. This, this, is, um, this can be changed. Uh, we, it tracks statistics such as users, memory, cache, processes, uh, file size, record counts, and more. It works in compiled mode, interpreted, and built applications. Uh, this can be used before a problem arises. It's actually very important that you use this before a problem arises. Um, that way you're able to have historical data points that do not depict a problem that you can then use to compare um, against the, the, the data points that show the problem. Um, and it, it, this allows you to look for trends or, or changes when a problem arises. Maybe a trend might be that you know the memory is increasing and uh, maybe the free memory is decreasing to a point where there's actually logs that are, or not logs, but there's actually um, errors that are being listed, actual warnings that are being uh, listed and logged um, right before a crash, perhaps. So that could be a trend that you see. Um, it's also very important to point out that the 4D information component includes a graphing tool. Uh, the graphing tool is extremely useful. So I, I don't know if everybody um, gets that. I mean, if everybody knows that it's there, but it is there. And I'd like to uh, demonstrate some of that today. So first off, we're going to use this right here to um, to create some reports. Now, this is actually um, a, a pretty nifty little method here. Um, what we do here is this opens a unique process. And essentially, if you were running um, on a server, 40 server, there is an entry point in the information component, um, AA40 NP schedule report server right here, uh, where the mouse is kind of pointing at. What this does is it creates a stored procedure on the server that runs by default every five minutes. Um, you can modify that right there. But when you're running in single user, there's no, there's no similar process. Essentially, if you're running in 40 server, um, there's an entry point that exists for you where you just need to run this one command. And it, the component will automatically create a report every five minutes. It'll just keep creating it until the database uh, shuts down. But in single user, uh, what you're left with is this other method here that basically creates a single report. So what I've done here is I've created this method that's also available within the um, sample database, as well as the notes for this session, that essentially mimics a stored procedure in single user mode that allows you to create a report every five minutes. Uh, this runs until the process is either aborted or until you set the process variable of be quit. Uh, so this, uh, it, it allows you to create a report every five minutes in single user mode. Um, here is the actual method if you wanted to look at it. Um, the actual method. There we go. Again, this is included in the database. And this has been running this whole time that I've been uh, running this example. So let's just open the uh, 40 report parser. Again, this uh, report parser, this is included in the component that everybody gets. So if you're running the 40 information component, you already have access to this parser. So um, how do you use it? Well, it's quite simple. You click on the select folder button right here and the select folder button allows you to select another folder. If you choose yes, it lets you go to that location and select the folder. If you choose no, it'll just parse the folder that's already here. Uh, so what I've done is I've, I've gone ahead and I've parsed the folder that's already here, which is essentially the folder reports um, folder that pertains to the running application. So now that we have this, um, well, this is not really a graph now, is it? This is just a, a collection of data that is available that you can see. You can actually see here, like, you know, you can see at the top some of the minimum and maximum values that were observed, like the minimum used cache, the maximum used cache, the amount of RAM, free memory that we're seeing. Uh, you can also go through and you can see each report from here. 
and you can see the time that it was created, the date that it was created, you can see how much memory uh, existed, how long it took to create the report. Um, now, if you just simply up here at the top, there's a graphs button. By clicking on that graphs button, what it does is it lets you open up a graph. This graph is, um, it, it, it depicts the graphs that, or, or the, the logs that exist within the folder reports. So from here, uh, you can drill down to a specific area. So for example, right now what I'm going to do, I'm looking for the zoom button. There's supposed to be a zoom button. Um, I believe this is it. Yeah, that's the zoom button. And then we can just get over to where we were. So part of the reason why there's gaps here is because there was gaps between when this database was ran. But as you can see here, each of these vertical lines depicts a, um, a log. So at this point right here, the memory was, uh, there was 8 megs of uh, used cache out of a 400 megabyte cache size. Um, not much, but we could see that it did increase right here. Um, and yeah, so there was no real issue on this specific log. Another thing that you're going to want to be aware of here is that you can hold shift and hit the attention button. And when you do that, it changes the data points that are here. Now, I might have just said that there was no issue during this set of logs, but apparently, as you can see here, I was wrong. Uh, the attention section, the number of attention items does appear to go up over time. So let's click the shift, uh, hold shift and click attention one more time. As, as we do that, it brings these items out even further into our uh, view. So if we were to click on these or just hover over, we'll see that there's a section there that kind of updates as we hover over them. Uh, so right here we can see the attention items that existed at that specific moment of the log. And essentially it looks like, you know, there's no backup set. The system is Mac OS 10.14. The IP address has changed since startup. That's an interesting um, situation. And the selector uh, 44 SQL engine case sensitivity is equal to one, and the number of deleted tables is one. But if we move over just a little bit, we'll see that it actually um, causes, there we go, right there, there's another attention item. Uh, it looks like the free memory got very low. Um, now, you don't see the free memory right now. I think I, that's because I needed to click on update SVG a couple times here. The update SVG command cycles through and it, it cycles through the items that are available and listed. There we go. That one shows free memory. Free memory is this, uh, I, I don't know, this magenta color, this, this um, maroon color, I guess, reddish, dark red, brown color. I don't know, maybe I'm colorblind. Um, but so it's this line down here. And as you can see, it, it, it kind of dropped between the running of these databases and it goes down and comes back up quite a bit. Um, so that's one of the items that it was referring to here. Now, if we go back and we look at one of these other sections, does the number of, of air items go up even more? I don't know. I think it does, but I don't really see any more. It's pretty much just the free memory and oh wait there there was another one just a moment ago oh you know what I see the attention item it's on the same line up there so you know what here's what here's what we're gonna do we're gonna double click on one of these which opens up the report and I'm gonna bring this into view and I'm gonna scroll down and show you guys the attention section what we're looking at here this is the, this is the actual reports that are created this is actually really cool to look at here um, here it is. This is the other attention item. Uh, it looks like it was mistakenly being put onto the one single line there, but the computer has not been restarted for more than three weeks. So that, that there is the additional line item. Um, so if you're ever interested in seeing what the actual information is that's in here, um, by all means, just look in a report. You can see lots of useful information here. You can see the computer name, the computer user, the manufacturer, the computer kind, the amount of memory. I'm not going to go through and read off everything, but there are a few things that I want to point out in here. Uh, you can see how long the application has been running for. You can see the version of 4D that's running, the build number of 4D that's running. You can see the mode, whether it's interpreted or compiled. 
you can see the UUID of the structure and the data file, which honestly should always match. If these two things don't match, then uh, your application is not going to run. So um, what else? We can see the size and the location, the modification time of the structure file, the index, the data file, the data index, and the match file. We can see which plugins are installed and we can see the plugin bundles. We can also see the components that are installed and we can see the component information. We can see the backup information right here and we can also see um, the backup preferences right here. Uh, we can see the involved disks that are included on the machine like the hard drives whether they're SSD or mechanical based um, or PCI Express based. You can see a lot of information about the hard drives. This is useful because maybe you're getting an issue with the machine that has a 5400 RPM drive. So we can also see information about the memory and uh, some information about uh, the licenses here and the uh, database parameters here. Um, additional database parameters and this is actually really what I was trying to look for. Right above the attention section there's an area that talks about the processing duration in report. This is actually how long it took to generate this report. This line right here is telling us it took 88 milliseconds to gather all of this information and put it together in this report. Again, 88 milliseconds. Now, that 88 milliseconds of execution time is done every five minutes. So that's how much um, of an impact this may have on your database. Not much. Uh, to, to just take 88 milliseconds out of a five minute range of time I don't think that's going to hurt your database at all. And the amount of information that you get from that is a lot, a lot of information. And we haven't even gotten into the section here that shows you the tables. Down here at the bottom, you can see tables, which tells you how many tables there are, how many records there are, uh, whether or not there's indexes, and whether or not there are triggers. Now, this is useful because uh, if you have a lot of these, you may see that the number of records changes from report to report to report. And that's useful information if you're wondering why your database just got much larger. You know, you might be able to go back and determine that, oh, our, our record count just doubled or something of that nature. So there's various different uh, pieces of information that are available in the information component. All of them are extremely useful um, for various different situations and that is why I think it's important that this get enabled before a problem arises uh, that way you know you're able to go back and look at what it was prior to the problem all right getting back into the uh, presentation here now let's look at the Mac OS crash reports so when an application crashes on Mac OS, the operating system creates a file that summarizes the crash and stores this information along with other log files on the system. So um, essentially these crash reports are created automatically when an application crashes on Mac OS. They contain useful information about the crash, including information about 4D, the running version of 4D, as well as the internal call stack to 40. This is 40's call stack, not your call stack. Um, it's useful uh, for us to understand at what point in execution the code was. It also includes memory statistics uh, for the crashed application. So, um, you know, all of this information combined is useful for you to basically understand what might have happened during a crash. So, let's take a quick look at that. Let's see if we can find some crash reports here on this system. Just one moment. What we need to do is we need to open up the console application. So what we'll do is we'll just run console like that. And now from here what we can do is we can go into the, uh, I believe it's the library logs. You know, this changes around from version to version. Sometimes you need to just poke around. Uh, sometimes it's in user reports. Sometimes it's in system reports. Essentially, what it's going to be is it's going to have a. Um, it's going to be the naming convention here is going to be the name of the application. So it should be 4D. Um, 
which I don't have here. I was supposed to grab some. Maybe I'm in the wrong folder. Let's look here. No. Diagnostic reports down here? No. Retired? I should have had some here. Why are they not here? These are not the right logs that I was looking for. These are not the logs you were looking for. Yeah, I honestly... Crash Reporter. Core Capture. Why don't I have any crash logs? Did I purge them? Do they get purged? I don't think so. Maybe they get purged at the end of the month. Oh my gosh. Well, this is good, I guess, because I, I don't have any crashes, um, which shows that 40 has been very stable. Um, but essentially, you should have some logs here. I'm going to probably need to do a retake of this. All right, let's move right along. Now, next, let's talk about dump files on Windows. Now, on Windows, there's a concept known as dump files. Uh, these dump files are created automatically by the operating system when an application crashes. Um, even though the dump file is created automatically by the operating system, sometimes, Sometimes they're unable to be created for various reasons. For example, maybe the application is running from a UAC protected location. Uh, so we have a tool known as proc dump to help produce a dump if it is not happening naturally. The dump files made by proc dump are, uh, they contain much more information, um, a lot more information. Uh, so actually using proc dump is sort of recommended. Um, but if you're not using proc dump, having the automatic dump file is just as, it's still useful. So it's important to point out here though, that um, dump files are not readable by the customer and they must be analyzed by 40 staff. Uh, essentially the symbol files are not publicly available and in either case, um, they contain, the, the, the dump files contain internal call stack information and some memory values. Va values which help us to understand at what point the application's execution was when it crashed. Um, I don't really have a demonstration for this, but I did want to point out again that dump files are only created on Windows and they can't really be analyzed by you. So if you, if you have some dump files from some crashes and you would like to get additional information about them, please create a TAU case, a case with uh, 4D tech support and let us know. Please include information such as which build number was used to create the dump file. That is very important for us to have. Um, next, let's talk about the event viewer on Windows. So the Windows OS has an event viewer. This event viewer contains uh, information about crashes, among other tidbits of information. Uh, it also includes information when a 40 application starts up or when the web server starts and things like that. The, the Windows Event Viewer is not specific to 4D. It's a Windows thing. It's kind of like the console that we opened earlier on Mac OS, um, but it's on Windows. Uh, it contains information from all sorts of applications. Every application on the OS can write to the Event Viewer. So let's uh, summarize really quickly. So events are logged automatically when an application crashes on Windows. And the events contain information such as the time and the date and the faulty module. Um, the faulty module can be useful for determining you know, um, the general area that 40 crashed in. For example, maybe it says HTTP server or uh, DB4D. Um, they're DLL files, essentially, is what the faulty module is. It kind of helps you to isolate which section of code the crash occurred in. Um, dump files provide a lot more information, but the event viewer and the faulty module gives you a hint. 
So, um, yeah, it's right here. More information. Yep, often found in the dump file. Let's look quickly at what some of these look like. Uh, I don't have, I'm on Mac right now, so I don't have a demo to run, but I do have some examples to show you. So right here we can see this is a faulting um, application. It shows that 4D.exe is the faulting application, uh, but the faulting module here was textcore.dll. Um, we can also see, uh, luckily, the path of how this was saved. We can see that this was build number 245877. So all of that's useful information. Um, let's see. I think we have another one here. So here is a 4D.exe that is crashed, and it shows that the faulting module is GUI.dll. Now, again, um, this is just sort of a way for you to understand that the the module where the crash occurred was in the GUI. So it's less likely that this specific crash was related to, for example, the database engine or the SQL engine or even the web server. In this specific situation, the crash was related to the GUI, something in the GUI, something with maybe an open window. Again, dump files are a lot more um, useful but the event viewer can give you a hint as to where the issue may have occurred. And more specifically, if, for example, you just weren't sure whether or not something happened, it's very useful to just go back and look through your event viewer to see whether or not there were events that got logged. So um, I don't really have a demonstration, as I said, and any questions should be directed to the uh, forums on discuss.40.com. So with that being said, Thank you very much.